It's ad break time. The Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, and they have some great stuff coming up. Fans of Thousand Year Old Vampire will be delighted to know that their next Kickstarter project is Jason Cox's 500 Year Old Vampire, a new project designed to be a cooperative writing experience that you can try with your friends at home, but that is also written to meet national classroom standards. Jason was my guest for episode 102, so you can listen to that interview and learn more directly from him. Also, I'll be teaching a class for CMU's Certificate in Applied Game Design, so if you ever wanted to take a class with me, here's your chance. The course is called Using Games to Teach What You Can Convey Through Play. It starts March 6th, and registration is open right now. Lastly, I'm going to throw in an ad for myself. If you want to show some love for my show and for my upcoming public scholarship projects, I would be deeply grateful for your support on Patreon at patreon.com slash beyond solitaire. My goal is to get to a point where I can spend my summers doing board game work instead of summer school, and you'd be helping me make that happen. For now, though, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here with a very special guest this week, Dr. Adrienne Shaw. She is Professor of Media Studies and Production at Temple University. How are you doing, Adrienne? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, I invited you on because I read a book you wrote a few years ago called Gaming at the Edge. Um, so why don't you, though, just give us like a little rundown of what your academic work looks like so people can understand that media studies and production actually means video game awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so like since, since I was in graduate school, so starting around 2005, I've been focused on video games and specifically the representation of marginalized groups in video games, um, particularly focused on LGBTQ representation, but I've done work on race and gender and nationality, um, various other identities intersecting. Um, my earliest work focused on players, um, understanding players under relationship to representation, as well as interviewing people who made make and design games about why certain content is or isn't included in games. And then for the last, um, well, so the last nearly seven years, I've been focused on the LGBTQ Game Archive, which is a website database I maintain that docu is documenting all LGBTQ content in video games dating back to the 1980s. Um, so for a variety of uh, professional and technical reasons, I've been digging much more into older game histories things that we forgot existed, um, and looking at game text through the lens of somebody who understands it from players and designers' perspective. Let's start with the early work and then kind of move up until now. So one thing that really struck me about Gaming at the Edge was that you really challenged the idea of identification and representation as sort of political categories and you wanted to push for something a little deeper than that um can you maybe explain kind of where you were going with that and and what led you to those conclusions that that, that needed to be changed yeah i mean i think that there's the the language around why and how representation matters got uh particularly coming from a media studies background, the way it always gets explained, it either gets explained in sort of an educative model where it's like, you need good representation of marginalized groups so that people who are in the majority group will treat those people well. And it's not that that's, that's wrong necessarily, but it is different than the sort of more marketing oriented goal of people should be represented in media so that they can see themselves represented. Um, and that, that so they can see themselves in it became sort of, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, became how people talked about it almost centrally in video games. So like, if you want more queer people to play your video games, put queer people in it. If you want more women to play your video games, put women in it. But that sort of cuts against all like actual experience of playing video games where women have always played video games. Queer people have always played video games. Um, and we had tons of popular franchises of games with a central female character that men were playing. So clearly it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, and I wanted to, to make a case for representation without assuming who the audience was, because I thought that that might be a way to sort of cut through those competing logics. Because the counter to that, 
is that if if representing a group well to educate a, a majority group is important isn't important to you, then you have no reason to represent groups well. If marketing to a specific marginalized group isn't important to you, you have no reason to represent that group well. But my own experience with media, with talking to other people about games especially, is indicated that's not true. That's We're much more complicated than that in terms of who we're willing to identify with and what kinds of characters we're willing to connect with. So I wanted to try to figure out a way to make a case for representation that could account for that, could account for our complexity as humans and our ability to relate to uh, representation on the screen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I really liked especially your comments about how various identities, of course, we, we're all comprised of a number of different ones, but they also mean different things in different contexts. So femininity is not the same thing in one space as it is in another one so how do you how do you do a good academic study with something that's so fluid <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know it, one of the things that um that i learned from media studies especially like uh what we call like the critical cultural studies approaches to media studies is like all the best i don't say maybe it's unfair to say the best it's my i'm on the podcast i get to say it, it's the best all the best research tries to find a way to back into what it is you're trying to study rather than put a like cordon around and say, I'm only talking to this group of people. So like, for example, you know, I've heard I've whoever is citing my book describes one of the identities that is relevant to the thing they're talking about. So like I've heard people describe my book as being only interviewing women gamers or only interviewing queer gamers, but it's actually like it's, uh, intersecting identities. So there, there are white dudes, there are white trans dudes, and and Latinx dudes, and mixed race dudes in there as well. It was looking at the intersections of gender, race, and sexuality. And so rather than saying I'm only going to talk to this group of people, I was like, I want to talk to all of the people who, in some way, fall outside the the stereotype from marketing that gamers are white cis dudes who are heterosexual. Like I was I would talk to anybody else except for that central category. And because I think that by talking to a wide mix of people and sort of backing in and and I didn't focus on a specific game, I didn't focus only on people who play online or offline. I wanted like a really big diversity of the kind of gaming people were into and the kind of identities that they have. And one of the reasons I did that was because when you in, in, in research, if you are only recruiting people who are members of a minority group to talk about representation of that minority group, there are two pressures. Either, and I experienced this in some of my research, either to say representation doesn't matter to me, I'm not that, that hung up on it, which I've seen in some interviews, or like representation really matters of this identity, but they won't talk about their other identities. So part of it is just sort of thinking of a way to sort of get at the question without coming to it with a sort of an existing suspicion about what what's going to matter to somebody. Because some people I talked to, like um, their sexuality was much more salient part of their identity than their race necessarily was, or vice versa, or their class position mattered more to them, or a, some other part of their identity than what I necessarily would have recruited them for in a differently designed study. This is also fascinating because when we talk about representation in games, a lot of it really does come down to marketing. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've really done a lot of work to kind of separate people and what they want to see in their games from what sells games. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's one, I think the, I'm trying to remember who said it, but um, it's really hard for audiences to know what they might want whereas they can tell you what they like of what exists. And so trying to imagine better representation, trying to imagine what else games could be, trying to imagine like who else might enjoy games is actually is, is, is difficult if I just like ask you, well, what is good representation? I mean, I teach this as a class, right? Like we spend entire semesters where by the end of it, the goal is actually to not have a clear idea of what good representation is because it's contextual. And I think that one of the things I find throughout my research is that 
people are really interested in seeing media that's not just about them, there is a vocal minority of people, and we'll see this with any like any new game that comes out, any game that represents marginalized groups in any way. You'll see a bunch of vocal vocal minority of people who are really mad about it. But it's just them. Like other people are fine with it. And actually my 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 own research and the research of other people suggest that it's the majority of people are actually much more interested in engaging in stories that aren't just about them and their own everyday life, right? And I think that one of the things, one of the cases I make in my book is that it's actually those moments where people say representation in, in games doesn't matter to them that makes the strongest case for games to be more diverse. So there are a lot, you know, my favorite quote in the title of one of my chapters is um, an interviewee was playing uh, Kratos in God of War. And she said, he could be a bunny rabbit for all I care. He's just the thing holding the knives, right? <laughs> and like the joy of that game, the earlier games, the new ones, totally different story, but the earlier games, the joy of that game is puzzle solving and fighting mythical creatures. And like, not who he is inherently. Some people might play it for that, but not inherently true. And so if we, if we think about that, like if we think about all the times in which he could be a bunny rabbit, like he could be a lot of other characters and like embracing the fact that the identity of the, the character on the screen could be a lot of different things and the game would be just as enjoyable is something that I'd hoped would, you know, resonated with more people that would be a better case for representation than just you should represent women when you want to recruit when we want women as an audience, or you should represent queer people when you want queer people as an audience. Right. So, I mean, I, I liked hearing you say that because one thing I was thinking as I was reading, you know, those sorts of comments was like, well, does this then support the argument that we might as well just leave things as they are and just have a bunch of white dudes because no one minds. And I think it's actually, yeah, it's the flip side that why does it have to be any one sort of person? Because really it could be anyone and theoretically everyone could still enjoy it just as much. Absolutely right. Like the idea that um, that if it doesn't matter, we don't have to fix it. Well, actually, if it doesn't matter, then there's no harm in fixing it, right? One of the things that um, most media industries find is like audiences want more diverse, like audiences not just diversity in the in the sense of identities, but more kinds of content, more different content. Like, and I think especially in gaming, like there's a tendency to think about the newer, more impressive graphics or faster or more complicated or more features and it's like actually i i find in my own experience and that of people i i interview or people i know or people i work with like a diversity of experiences like the gaming experience to be different um and so like we don't need 20 games with the um the scraggly beard dude with brown hair in cargo pants going through a jungle or a desert or the rainforest, right? Like we we don't need 20 of those games because the joy of playing it is about exploring that space, not necessarily about find feeling like that character is you. That makes a lot of sense. And then this also kind of extends, I think, maybe to some of our discussions about why we need to hire more diversely. Uh, because you had also a lot of really interesting comments about, um, you know, it's not necessarily a great idea to be like, I want more women in our video games and we want more women to buy them. So that's, let's hire some women. That's what they're for. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that position such a problem? Because I feel like that's still very prevalent now. It's been several years since you wrote your book and that has not changed. <laughs> no, it hasn't. And like my, my favorite quote is a, a friend of mine who worked, who has worked in the game industry for many years. And it's like, she doesn't do recruiting girls into the game industry events because she's like, why would I hire them to go into that meat grinder? Like it is not, it is like not every game company is toxic, but the industry itself like is still in the process of try of going through a reckoning of how do we make workplaces that are conducive to a variety of identities, a variety of, of um, people who are from different marginalized positions. And like, adding you know the the just add women and stir approach isn't going to fix that it's it's going to make it an uphill battle for everything they want to do and also as we've seen it historically it makes them a like any change that happens if people are mad about it it makes those women the target of 
the internet's ire, but then also some, you know, people who stalk those women or threaten those women with physical violence because something got changed in the game. And so like adding more people to the industry doesn't fix it. But also, and I think I said this in the book, like not all women are feminists, right? Like there's nothing inherent of like being a woman that will necessarily mean that you will make better representations of women in your games. It's it's an approach, not something that is inherent to who we are as people. Like you have to think complexly about representation or at the very least like have an awareness of why it matters to make it better. And that's not something that's true just because you happen to be a certain identity. Right. So when somebody actually comes down to it and says, okay, well then why does it matter? Uh, I feel like your why is different from the sort of standard whys. So where are you at with that now when, when that question is posed? Yeah. I mean, I think, and you know, I think I say it in the book, like representation matters because it, it, allows us to see the variety of ways of being in the world that are possible, right? Like both for ourselves and for others, like it gives us a sense of like what type of people can be literally like what, what types of, what types of real experience are out there. And I mean, I say this to my students all the time. It gives us imagine the possibility to imagine that our experiences aren't the only experiences. And so Some of that's about empathy. Some of that, yes, is about like trying to educate groups, but it's more about like giving us access to things that we haven't experienced firsthand and giving us language to articulate who we are. Um, But because I mean, I, I teach an LGBTQ representation class and like a lot of what my students talk about is like finding a way to talk about who they are by seeing it in the media first, because it's not something you're necessarily introduced to by your parents, or it's not language that we're always given. Um, And so I think thinking about it, not in terms of effects, but in terms of possibility is much more, is much more what we actually mean when we say it matters. We try to put all sorts of media effects labels on it and measure it and demonstrate and prove that it matters. But at the end of the day, we all have experiences of like media being powerful for us, a powerful way to experience the world in a different way. And I think that's that's what I think is more important for me to focus on. Nice. So your media studies focus has always been games. Uh, but I feel like, I feel like in some ways, you know, gaming is still a relatively young industry, I guess, although it's been around a long time now. Um, <laughs> why do we, I, treat... I make a, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll interrupt. I make a joke that, um, the game industry is old enough to be a part of AARP. <laughs> <laughs> so young, younger, but it's still pretty old. <laughs> yes. I mean, I consider myself a lifelong gamer and like, has my life been super long? No, but may it happen. But like, <laughs> but I guess I still feel like we talk about games as if they are different in media and we treat them very differently from other types of media. Is that something that you agree with? And if so, like, where are those points of difference that you find significant? I mean, I think that for me, and I, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with people who aren't really into games. And I think that there's a perception among people who aren't super into games, like they all think that they know what games are. And anybody who (laughs) studies games or spends a lot of time with games is like, none of us agree at what games, like what's a game, like lots of things. Like it's, I mean, it's an entire area of study for a reason, like what makes a game a game. Um, But I do but I think that people have a preconception that games are fun, that they're twitchy, that they're violent, that they're about winning and all of those things. And it, it never necessarily was true. Um, but there, there are, when it comes to the experience of playing games, there are some things that are different in terms of being a media scholar and analyzing it, right? So like, if I assign my students to watch a, a movie, while they might all get something different out of the movie, I can guarantee that as long as they watched it, they all watched the same thing. Whereas if I ask my students to play a game, 
if they didn't click on the thing that somebody else clicked on or they picked a different option than what somebody else clicked on or if they couldn't even figure it out and get through it that their experience of it isn't going to be as as similar to somebody who had to to somebody else who played it and so like that experiential difference changes some of the stakes of if we're talking about representation it changes how we analyze it it changes some of the stakes of um whether or not we want to give creators too much credit for including that representation so like uh anna anthropy is a game designer and she refers to pressing the gay button and so if there's content where like you only see that these characters are gay if you meet at a certain place at a certain time with certain abilities enabled and you say the right lines and then it turns out they're gay like there's so many examples of that in gaming history or like one-off characters that you only find if you go down a certain narrative path versus more and more games now where if you play the game you will see that that character is gay and it's that's not avoidable and it's part of the storyline and everyone who plays that game will see it and so in terms of studying representation that's different when it comes to why representation matters, um, you know, I talk about this in the in the book as well. The fact that they are things that you can play and the identity of the person matters a little less. I mean, I don't, I know, I know so many game writers, and I know that they don't want to hear this, but sometimes we don't really care about the story, right? Sometimes we're just playing the game to play the game, and like that is a space for more representation, as I said, because like the identity of the person isn't what's enjoyable or what's central about experiencing it whereas if it's a you know if it's a rom-com and the people getting together aren't people you're particularly interested in then it's going to be more let you're going to have less investment in the rom-com if you don't care about the two characters where i feel like you can be just as invested in a video game if you don't care about the characters at all or if you hate the storyline um i think that's that's the the difference for me, but I think in terms of representation, it matters just as much. It's just it matters in a, how it matters, it changes. If that makes sense, I don't know. Yes, and there's something else I wanted to kind of press on because I was skimming back through your book the last couple of days, and I, I noted it because I thought it was really interesting. Um, you noted, um, and I think that at the time you subscribed to this belief, and I want to make sure that you still do, <laughs> that games are not necessarily more interactive than other media. I thought that was a really interesting statement, especially because I think that people talk about, and I've talked about games like, oh, well, the thing that's interesting is that games ask, ask you to take actions. They ask you to embody something um, as opposed to just passively look at it um is that in media studies is that an accepted viewpoint or do people question that oh uh no nobody agrees with me no um <laughs> well I, I don't know if that's true i think that one of the things i've tried to push back on is the idea that what makes a good game is something that is deeply interactive and i think i've played a ton of games recently things that that we might even just call them interactive narratives right that they're game-like in a lot of ways, but a lot of the time is just spent watching them and they're still deeply enjoyable and do cool, unique things that you couldn't do in any other medium. And so like games are interactive, but I think that one of the things that a lot of people assumed in early game studies, and I honestly still know, that because you're playing as a character, you automatically take on that identity or because games are interactive, they're somehow more engaging than other media. And I don't think that's true. I, you know, I play a lot of games that I would describe as boring. I mean, that's part of life stage. That's part of like how I unwind, but like that the medium of games doesn't inherently require engagement and excitement and fun and interactivity like there's there's something else there that's really interesting about them you know i've watched the interactive shows on netflix where you get to pick what option happens next and that never really feels like a game to me that feels like a tv show that they recorded multiple scenes and you pick a letter and you get to go to the next scene and like that feels like an interactive narrative where i've played games like we are ofk which is a recent game that i finished that beautiful and it feels like watching a tv show that at moments asks me to play a game in it 
And that sounds, if I describe that to you, everyone's like, that's not a game, that sounds boring. But it's actually really, really good. <laughs> and like part of the the gaminess of it is is wanting to to see what I'm allowed to play around with in those moments that are playful, as opposed to the story itself is driven by interactivity. I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but like there's, I think I know a lot of people who are sort of embracing slower games and meditative games and more relaxing games. Um, and just as they are embracing more interactive TV or um, different types of storytelling in other media, like I think that interaction isn't something that just exists in games. Yeah, I actually brought it up because, you know, it, reading that made me think about something that has always been true for me. So my channel is about games. But if I if you ask me to give up books or games as a media choice, uh, I would keep the books and give up the games without without thought. There'd be no mm -hmm. question. Because I do occasionally get emotional during games, especially video games where that world is kind of constructed for you and you're taken through a storyline. But I get way more attached emotionally to what's happening in books than I ever do in a game and i feel like my experiences are the opposite of what you would expect if you think that interactivity and embodying a character makes something more visceral for you um and i've just always kind of wondered about that <laughs> yeah no i mean I, i'm thinking of like I, I i've been um doing a bunch of judging for various different game things lately and so i've played like it's i don't know like three dozen games in the last three months um and one of the things that I I found amazing is that like I also finished a book series in the same month in the same month long period and like I miss the book characters more like when I like I I play I am a self confessed completionist like I will play a game until there's nothing left to eke out of that game but I rarely want to go back like there are people who love going back to games and and I don't I I think that's lovely but like there are very few games that I want to like go and experience again and again and again the same way that I do my favorite books and I think that some of it is the work and the time involved like once I've read a book like I don't know I feel like I get attached to book characters whereas video games are their work and I get like what I want to achieve is what the game is asking me to do I don't feel the need to like play it again all the time well it's not true there are very few games there are very few games <laughs> that I'll, I will play again um it's a it's a significantly shorter list than the games that I enjoy whereas the list of books that I enjoy and would enjoy again and again is much longer the list of movies the list of tv shows that I like there are tv shows I've watched like a, a bazillion times and would watch again and again. But gaming, there's something about it that is a different experience. And like, I I know what it is, I've come to it. <laughs> Especially in like action games where like you build up this character that becomes all powerful. I hate replaying it again because I hate going back to the beginning when I can't do anything. Yes, that is such a familiar, <laughs> yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, yes. Or like, or like, <laughs> A, a, a game that I really love is is Life is Strange to True, True Colors, but like, and I want to go back and explore the world more, but I already know what happens, so I want to only go back if they'll tell me another story. Like, I, like, I only want to go back to like, do the things I forgot to do or the things I didn't realize I had a limited option to do, but like, I don't necessarily want to start over. I just want the yes. world to be there and for me to have more experiences in that world. That's what I miss. Whereas like the stories and books are ones I want to relive the story. Yeah. I think a book though is easier on the reread and then a game is more likely to feel like a slog on it. Yes. I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, I, I will absolutely replay visual novels and go to all the different endings, but that is because you can do different save points. And also they let you fast forward through dialogue you've already seen and pause on new dialogue. And that is enough to get me to go back and, and pick through all the possibilities. Yeah, I mean, I think about it in terms of reading, like, you know, I'm I'm a fairly fast reader, but like there, if I've read the book before, I know what I can skim. Whereas games don't always let you skim in the same way. Like it's harder to yes. like, if you, it's harder to jump over the stuff. It's like, oh, I don't want to experience that again. 
um, yeah, I mean, it's it's weird because they it as an interactive medium, people talk about this for years of like we can experience time differently. It's like, but they're so friggin' linear. linear. <laughs> like, if you want to replay them again, you can't just say like, I want to play this game, but can I jump over the first five levels and just jump in? Like, you can jump back to a save point, but if you want to play as a new character, right? And, and in an RPG, you have to start from scratch and do the first like twenty hour slog, as you said, that you didn't love just to get back to the part that you wanted to experience with this new character. Yes. I I completely agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, game writers. I want to skip your dialogue at time. <laughs> so to kind of change course, uh, I want to talk about the LGBTQ video game archive. Um, how did you get this project started? And like, oh my gosh, how much, this is so much work. I'm going to link it in the show notes, by the way, for everybody. Uh, there's there's amazing stuff in here. How has this evolved over time? And you know, do you have a model that's going to keep working into the future? Uh, how are you future proofing it? I'm just sort of curious about all these things. Uh, so many questions. I mean, so it actually started um, after it started right after my my book came out, um, and I had wrapped up another big series of grant projects I'd been working on, and was ready to start the next big thing. And something I'd done back in I think it was. 2007 um, for a project where I was interviewing people who were in the game industry or related industries about instances of LGBTQ content in video games to sort of find out how that content came to be, what discussions there were around it. Um, and so I created a list of all the games I could find with LGBTQ content in 2007. It was like 51 games. Um, and tried to contact people who had worked on those games. A lot of that fell through. There are very few people I was actually able to interview who worked on the game. So instead, I talked to people in the industry generally about how and why they saw queer content as when it, when it got included and what the difficulties with including it were. Um, and I sort of put that list away, didn't plan on doing anything with it. The only reason I actually kept it is because um, the piece, the journal article that came out of it is called Putting the Game Games. And a reviewer asked, well, like, how do we know there's not enough content? And I was like, well, there are only 51 games. And I put it in a, in a footnote. There were 51 games in 2007. That seems like not a lot. <laughs> um, and like, it was just a snarky footnote response to a re reviewer question that wasn't terrible, but I found it a little bit annoying. Um, was it reviewer two? It's always number two. Um, I mean, it was, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and like, and it wasn't like, it's like, the, this is a really good paper, but let me find something that's wrong with it um, that isn't really a justifiable concern. Like, anybody who would take a passing glance at video game studies would know that that was the case. Um, fast forward to, like, 2014, and I had assumed, the reason I didn't do textual analysis or at least focus on game content for a long time is I kind of assumed somebody else would. Like I, like, I was making my little niche, like, audience studies and industry studies, and most games, most other media studies and a lot of game studies tend to focus on text, and so I assumed other people would take, do that, and by 2014, nobody had done it. It had been, a, you know, it had been seven years. Nobody had taken, had started to do the history of LGBTQ content in video games, and every time I did projects or was advising students or trying to work on new things, I found myself recreating a master list of games with queer content again and again. Um, and I was like, I, if I have to make this list, I might as well make it accessible to other people. And so I had an independent study student and a grad RA at the time, and we sort of went through and compile, compiled a new master list um, in 2014, 2015. And that initial master list had 151 games on it. And that seemed like a good achievable project. I'm going to go through, see what this content is, pull together all the information I can from websites, from YouTube videos, from walkthroughs, from wikis, all the information I can about this content um, because I can't possibly play, get access or play through all of these games. I'll put it online and then, yay, we'll be done and we'll just add to it as we go. That was naive <laughs> um, because as as I started researching the games on that master list, I kept finding new games that hadn't been on the list before. I found different, like, conflicting information about what content was in the games. 
Um, I found certain games took significantly longer. The Grand Theft Auto series took me two straight weeks of working full-time hours during a sabbatical just to document all the LGBTQ content in the GTA series. Um, every game in the database represents anywhere from eight to 80 hours of work. Um, and I also, once I made the site live, I started getting more people submitting more games that hadn't been on my master list or new games came out. Um, we partnered with Queerly Represent Me, which is a, a different website um, that collected their information using uh, broad surveys of people to submit games with LGBTQ content. And so quickly the list of 151 became 1200, became 2000. I think we're up to just over 2400 games on the master master list at this point. Um, and that's of like an exponential increase of all the games that get it added every single year. And so like at a certain point, it's not a fin it's not a finishable project. It's an ongoing project um, and one that because of professional responsibilities, um, I haven't had a ton of time to like continuously add to it in the last couple of years. Um, I've had lots of volunteers submit additions to it, um, but it's a constantly growing, changing project. And then going back and editing entries on old games when new information comes out or um, especially games from the 80s and 90s that we didn't have full records of and sort of going back and updating them once we do. Um, so I, you know, it's a labor of love that I'm going to just do for as long as I can do, basically. I don't know if, I don't know if future proofing is possible at this stage. I mean, uh, you know, I've been on a constant lookout for grants to pull it off of WordPress because WordPress limits some of the ways I can organize the information and make it accessible to people. But I've also collaborated with people who take elements of the underlying database that's not on the site um, and use it for different research purposes. Like part of the, I think, future proofing of it is just like sharing it with everybody else so that everybody can do a project on it because I couldn't possibly write about all of it in my lifetime. That makes sense. And actually, you know, you speak to, speaking of those games from the eighties and nineties that we don't have complete records of. So I'm a, I'm a classicist by training. So my heart just freezes in terror when I think about all the things that have been lost to time. And <laughs> I, I mean, we're lucky that, you know, you can still dig some papyri out of the ground in Egypt sometimes or like find, you know, the occasional cache of tax at this point. So I, one of my things that I always think about is, you know, we have all these digital records. What happens when our computers don't read them anymore? What happens when the last file is lost? You know, we think that the cloud is still trustworthy, but somebody has to pay for those servers and somebody has to plug them in. I mean... Could we just lose all of it? <laughs> how and how how do these old um, files come back to light? It's just just it's somebody's computer in a basement and they found it. Like how does this work? Yeah, I mean, so I'll give an example um, of a, a game, two games that like I helped bring back to the world and in, in a small part anyway. Um, Caper and the Castro by C M Ralph, which was released in uh, 1989. Um, as charity wear on BBS systems that people could like dial up and download it to their com their computers. Um, and CM also sold it through homebrew magazine catalogs so people could get the diskette sent to their house. Um, and also sold a version called Murder on Main Street where they just changed out all the names to make it straighter. Um, so like the, the lead detective character in Caper is um, um, Tracker McDyke and then in um, the straight version is like Tracker McDuff or something like that. So like just changing out little words to sell it to multiple audiences. Um, I, when I first did that list in 2007, had no idea that game existed. In 2014, a, a journalist had heard about the game and wrote a piece about it and then followed up and found CM and wrote an interview. So like in 2014, when I started the archive project, between 1989 and 2014, there was no record of this game existing, right? There was no journalism, no other marker of it. I um, sort of put it off for a while and then finally in 2017 con contacted CM myself to see if I could learn more. And they had just retired and were moving and found the original diskette. And we're like, Ooh. how do we recover this? And it's just like, one, like it 
just because they happened to keep them and find them again. Like they didn't even know where they were up until moving. Um, they're like, how do we get these off of the disc and back into the world? And um, it was only through a series of contacts. I finally got in touch with Andrew Borman at the Museum of Play in Rochester and CM packaged them up and mailed them to him. And because CM had used the proprietary version of, of HyperCard to program the game in the 1980s. Andrew had to find a 1980s era Mac that had HyperCard on it to insert the disks, to open the files, to image them so that they could then be playable via emulator. And then ultimately we were able to get Jason Scott to put it up on the internet archive. And so now you can, everybody can go and play Caper in the Castro from 1989. But it it's only because like I was able to be put in contact with somebody who had access to um, preserved computing machines from 30 years ago that could open up these files because otherwise they would just exist on a disk. It would just be, it'd be an artifact, but we'd have no tran translation of what it was, what was inside it, right? Um, Similarly, Gay Blade by Ryan Best came out in 1993. And Ryan, for a long time, when I first interviewed him about it, he had thought, like, I only found out about that game because I was searching old gay and lesbian press newspapers for stories about Caper and the Castro. And I came across a Village Voice article about this other game called Gay Blade that nobody had, hadn't been recorded about anywhere else, despite the fact that at the time, like, Ryan was interviewed on Howard Stern. It was covered in USA Today. Like it, it, it was appearing in like German language magazines in Berlin. But Whoa. somehow between like 1993 and 2017, we all forgot about it. Somebody played it, but with the rest, we all forgot about it. Like this is my lifetime. I feel like I should have heard about it, but I didn't. Um, and at first, Ryan had lost a bunch of his belongings when he was moving from Hawaii back to California, a case of his belongings sunk to the bottom of the ocean um, during transit. And so at first he thought it was on there, gone forever. After years of us interacting and planning um, Rainbow Arcade, which is an exhibit I hosted in Berlin, and we had invited him to come be part of one of the events, like after years of going back and forth, he finally one last time looked in the looked in a different place and uncovered the disc um and brought it to brought the files to berlin and we were able to work with some, with our tech supervisor at the exhibit who was able to get clean up the files enough to get them off but like we're talking like a global multi-year everybody trying to figure out how to make it work process and then again we were able to get it up on the internet archive and now it's it's there and available again, but like, we can't do that for every game. And those are two, those yeah. are two that I happened to learn about that happened to be written about in when they came out so that I, in the 2020s can go back and find those people, right? There are so many other things that they're just, were never recorded. So many, I mean, I'm especially imagining like, there's like, hundreds if not thousands of games that people just made for themselves and their friends that we have no record of um there are probably tons of other like cm and 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 ryan both lived in northern california around the same time and they never heard of each other's games like oh wow like we're not talking about like the game industry saving document like the game industry pioneers saving documents of the companies they put together we're talking about one-off artists who made a thing and that's the only thing they ever made and it's meaningful and important and historically significant but it's just there <laughs> like it's 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 until we find like the right combination of people and expertise it's just like uh uh we know it existed but we don't know what was on it and like i don't know when i when i first put the post about uh gay blade up like i had people from every continent searching for insisting that somebody must have that disc somewhere or a complete <laughs> manual somewhere um and like you know we finally find it but like it just reminds me of all of the other things that we don't have it reminds me of all the other things that we would have lost yeah for sure 
So one more serious question before we go into like we're chilled out end of interview stuff. So you run a video game archive that tracks and logs LGBTQ representation in games. Mm -hmm. How has this project been influenced by your previous work? I mean, you know, all all mm -hmm. archives involve some decision making. So mm -hmm. how have your beliefs about re about representation impacted your criterion for putting things in this archive? And then how has working in the archive had an impact on the views you went into it with? Yeah, I mean, I think the one is, I took the same approach to the archive as I took with the way I recruited people for my first book, which was my dissertation, right? Was I include anything on the master list that somebody somewhere has said had LGBTQ content in it, because then I can research it and then offer context for what that means. So I'll give a, a sort of counter example. There's this one game on, all of these lists that everyone said had this lesbian character in it. And I dug deep, I found long play videos of it, I watched the whole game, and I realized that the reason somebody said it had a lesbian is because there's one character, a female character, who by all accounts, through everything I can learn about this game is straight, refers to her woman friend as girlfriend. And like, People who grew up in the United States in a particular era, especially based on when the game was set, like that's a colloquialism. That's something like not just straight women, but especially straight women will refer to their their friends who are women as girlfriends. And it doesn't mean anything romantic. And like yeah. that was that was a good like 12 hours of me doing a deep dive into the history of this game to try to figure out why people thought there was a lesbian in it. But it's important for me to put that in the archive because otherwise, I mean, not to say that I'm trying to correct the public record, but like if somebody wants to go back and say what, how many games had gay characters in them, I don't want them to just go to the Wikipedia list and say, oh, everybody says this game has a lesbian in it. It's like, actually, it requires much a much deeper dive to understand who that character is. Um, similarly, like much of the research and much of the work that goes into the archive um, from from my perspective, it, it's not just sort of collecting, it's also like curating and trying to make sense of the content. It's trying to figure out like, does everybody see this content or is it only if you play the game in a certain way? So there's a game, Temple of Elemental Evil, that was got all these news stories for having a gay pirate that your character could marry. But what I discovered in writing up the entry for the game is that there are two pirates. If you meet him in one part of town, he wears a purple bandana and is gay and one of the male characters in your party can marry him. If you meet him in another t part of town, his bandana is red and he's straight and he marries the woman character in your party. And it's like, that's that's not how it had been written about, but those that changes what that means when we're trying to quantify or count or make sense of representation in this medium. And so like, I think part of it is a sensitivity to like the it dependsness from a player perspective and like the, that representation is an, is complex in video games in terms of what people see and how they see it. Um, and I also think like in terms of changing my perspective, like like bringing Caper and the Castro and Gay Blade back into the world have, were like so much more important to me than any academic publication. Like they have such, like that's a much more lasting impact for me than getting yet another journal article out and so i think it also changed my perspective on what my role is or what my goal is as an you know uh, granted with the privilege of tenure but as an academic like what i what i should be spending my time and resources on doing and like i've i've gotten so many letters from high school students um who go to the archive who just want to like find out more about other queer characters in games from like before they were born, which makes me feel ancient every time they say it. But like, but it's very sweet. And like, I like I want it to be a place for people to feel like they're like, when I started grad school and was interested in LGBTQ representation and is interested in video games, every single person was well-meaning or rude um, would say, is there any? I'd be like, yeah, of course there's some. And like, there was no language for like, yes, there is, there's lots of it. There's a history of it. It's not just the, the most recent game that you've heard of. And like making that tangible, making that real for people has become sort of much more important to me than um, what I thought it would be when I started with a list of 151 games and was like, yeah, I can bang this out over a single semester sabbatical. 
<laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> And now we're what, like six years later. I'm like, oh, why did I get myself into this? <laughs> Not really. So I love it. Games, games are your work and, and in many ways your life's work. But what are you playing for fun right now? Oh, um, I am playing Wildflowers. Um, W-Y-L-D-E Flowers. It is it is a game that is so like made for me. It is a game where you're basically trying to bring back your family's farm on this island where 50 to 60% of the inhabitants are queer, where your character's queer, or you have the option to be queer, and you're also part of a coven that your grandmother was part of and trying to unpack the hidden witchy mysteries of of the island in the face of a religious movement who's very worried about quote unquote malcontents who are leading meetings out in the woods like it's all the things I like in a single game and I wouldn't have expected that I would like it um because it's it's a lot cuter than games I tend to like it's very light and happy and casual but it has gardening and witches and queerness and yeah and it's delightful and I'm obsessed with it. I have looked this up. I am super interested. I mean, it's the religious study scholar in me, right? Like, ooh, it's witches who have religious opposition. I should... <laughs> and it's and it's like it's not like it's not framed as religion, but it it because it's like I don't know, it's semi Scientologist culty, but also ooh. so they're trying to be like religious without like there's no God in it. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. It's it's like this. Uh, I don't know. It's this it feels so well thought out like i want i want to go talk to the people who made it sometime because i like i love the way they put everything together and thought it out and And this is a cozy game oh i love cozy games my favorite my i i'm not gonna lie my favorite thing in the game is like you can cook food you you grow vegetables and you can raise animals and you can buy different produce from characters and then you cook food and then to become better friends with different people in the village like you make them their favorite dishes and you have to figure out what their favorite dishes are based on their their background and their identities and like you have a crystal ball that will tell you and there are plenty of ways to cheat online but like i don't know like trying to figure out what this what food will make this person happy is just like not an unexpected pleasure that this game has given me that is so cute actually like this is gonna go on my list of things to try (laughs) and then uh if people want to find you online um where can where can you be found yeah uh adrianshaw.com is the best way to get in touch with me and find all my work um i'm also very accessible on twitter at a adrianshaw a-d-r-i-s-h-a-w um on twitter it's also a good way and then uh my email address is all over the temple website (laughs) fantastic and of course i will link the lgbtq video game archive in the show notes as well um adrian thank you so much for coming on and giving us your time i appreciate it so much no this was fun thank you for having me absolutely and so for those of you who are out there who are listening hopefully you know i can be found anywhere anywhere online as beyond solitaire Uh, thank you so much for watching everybody please like subscribe comment ask questions and most of all happy gaming